Exchange is accomplished in two forms, which I propose to illustrate. Here with reference to the value of labor. In so far as there is a desire for leisure, or for the use of energy for its own sake in recreation, or for the avoidance of painful effort, all labor is undeniably a sacrifice. However, there is also a certain amount of latent work energy which either we do not know how to employ or which manifests itself in an impulse to voluntary labor which is not incited by need or by ethical motives. A number of demands compete for this quantity of labor power, the use of which is not in itself a sacrifice, but not all of them can be satisfied. For every use of energy, one or more other possible and desirable uses have to be sacrificed. Unless we could utilize the energy to perform labor A also for labor B, there would not be any sacrifice in doing labor A, the same is true for B if we execute it instead of A. What is sacrificed eudaimonistically is not labor, but rather non-labor, we pay for a not by sacrificing labor since, as we presuppose, here labor does not involve any disutility, but by renouncing B. The sacrifice that we give in exchange by our labor may be, so to speak, either absolute or relative, the disutility is either directly connected with labor, where this is experienced as toil and pain, or it is indirect in the case where labor is eudaimonistically irrelevant or even of a positive value, but we can acquire one object only by renouncing another. Thus the instance of enjoyable labor can also be related to the form of exchange a sacrifice which characterizes the economy. The idea that objects have a specific value before they enter into an economic relationship in which each of the two objects of the transaction signifies for one contracting party the desired gain and for the other the sacrifice is valid only for a developed economy, but not for the basic processes on which the economy rests. The logical difficulty, that two things can only be of equal value if each of them has a value of its own, seems to be illustrated by the analogy that two lines can be equally long only if each of them has a definite length. But strictly speaking, a line gains the quality of length only by comparison with others. For its length is determined not by itself since it is not simply long, but by another line against which it is measured, and the same service is performed for the other line, although the result of the measurement does not depend upon this act of comparison, but upon each line as it exists independently of the other. Let us recall the category that embraces the objective value judgment, which I termed metaphysical, from the relationship between us and objects develops the imperative to pass a certain judgment, the content of which, however, does not reside in the things themselves. The same is true in judging length, the objects themselves require that we judge them, but the quality of length is not given by the objects and can only be realized by an act within ourselves. We are not aware of the fact that length is established only by the process of comparison and is not inherent in the individual object on which length depends, because we have abstracted from particular relative lengths the general concept of length, which excludes the definiteness without which specific length does not exist. In projecting this concept onto objects we assume that things must have length before it can be determined individually by comparison. Moreover, definite standards have grown out of the innumerable comparisons of length and they form the basis for determining the length of all tangible objects. These standards embody as it were the abstract concept of length, they seem no longer to be relative because everything is measured by them, while they themselves are no longer measured. The error is the same as if one believes that the falling apple is attracted by the earth, while the earth is not attracted by the falling apple. Finally, we delude ourselves as to the inherent quality of length by the fact that the multiplicity of elements, the relationship of which determines substance, already exists in the individual parts. If we were to assume that there is only a single line in the whole world, it would not have any specific length since it lacks any relation to others. It is impossible to measure the world as a whole, because there is nothing outside the world in relation to which it could have a specific size. This is true of a line so long as it is considered without being compared with others, or without its own parts being compared with each other, it is neither short nor long, but lies outside the whole category. This analogy makes clear the relativity of economic value rather than disproving it. If we regard the economy as a special case of the general form of exchange a surrender of something in order to gain something, then we shall at once suspect that the value of what is acquired is not ready-made but rather accrues to the desired object wholly or in part from the extent of the sacrifice required. These frequent and theoretically important instances seem indeed to contain an inner contradiction, would the sacrifice of a value be required for valueless objects? 
No reasonable person would give away a value without receiving an equal value in return, and it would be a perverted world in which the desired object attained its value only as a result of the price that had to be paid for it. This is an important point so far as our immediate consciousness is concerned, more important than the popular viewpoint will admit. In fact, the value that a subject sacrifices can never be greater, in the particular circumstances of the moment, than the value that he receives in return. All appearance to the contrary rests on a confusion of the value experienced by the subject and the value which the object in exchange has according to other apparently objective forms of appraisal. Thus, during a famine somebody will give away a jewel for a piece of bread because under the given conditions the latter is more valuable to him than the former. It always depends upon circumstances whether sentiments of value are attached to an object, since every valuation is supported by an elaborate complex of feelings which are always in a process of flux, adjustment and change. It is of no significance in principle. Whether the circumstances are momentary or relatively enduring. If the starving person gives the jewel away he demonstrates unambiguously that the piece of bread is more valuable to him. There is no doubt that, at the moment of exchange, of offering the sacrifice, the value of the object received sets a limit up to which the value of the object offered in exchange can rise. Quite independent of this is the question as to where the object received derives its value, whether it is perhaps the result of the sacrifice offered so that the balance between gain and cost is established a posteriori by the sacrifice. We shall see in a moment that value often originates psychologically in this seemingly illogical manner. Once the value has been established, no matter how, there is a psychological necessity to regard it as being of equal value with the sacrifice. Even superficial psychological observation discloses instances in which the sacrifice not only increases the value of the desired object, but actually brings it about. This process reveals the desire to prove one's strength, to overcome difficulties, or even simply to be contrary. The necessity of proceeding in a roundabout way in order to acquire certain things is often the occasion, and often also the reason, for considering them valuable. In human relations, and most frequently and clearly in erotic relations, it is apparent that reserve, indifference or rejection incite the most passionate desire to overcome these barriers and are the cause of efforts and sacrifices that, in many cases, the goal would not have seemed to deserve were it not. For such opposition, the aesthetic enjoyment of mountain climbing would no longer be highly regarded by many people if it did not exact the price of extraordinary effort and danger, which constitute its charm, appeal and inspiration. The attraction of antiques and curiosities is often of the same kind. If there is no aesthetic or historical interest attached to them, this is replaced by the mere difficulty of acquiring them, they are worth as much as they cost, which leads to the conclusion that they cost as much as they are worth. Furthermore, moral merit always signifies that opposing impulses and desires had to be conquered and sacrificed in favor of the morally desirable act. If such an act is carried out without any difficulty as a result of natural impulse, it will not be considered to have a subjective moral value, no matter how desirable its objective content. Moral merit is attained only by the sacrifice of lower and yet very tempting goods, and it is the greater the more inviting the temptations and the more comprehensive and difficult the sacrifice. Of all human achievements the highest honor and appreciation is given to those that indicate, or at least seem to indicate, a maximum of commitment, energy and persistent concentration of the whole being, and along with this, renunciation, sacrifice of everything else, and devotion to the objective idea. Even in those cases where, by contrast, aesthetic performance, and the ease and charm that originate from a natural impulse, exercise a supreme attraction, this is also due to the resonance of the efforts and sacrifices that are usually required for such accomplishments. The significance of a connection is often transferred to its opposite by the mobility and inexhaustible power of association in our mental life, as, for example, the association between two representations may take place as a result of the fact that they affirm each other or deny each other.